the central processing unit. It's probably the first thing you decide on when building your own computer, and for good reason. In most cases, the CPU is the deciding factor for how much money you should spend on other components, the graphics card, system RAM, and even the power supply, so this video will revolve around my personal experiences with each of these. I have tested and benchmarked every single one, so much of what I say will be fact. I have several videos in this description to support what I say, but without a doubt my conclusions overall will be more of a matter of opinion, how much bang for the buck I think you're getting for each of these processors and why you'd want to buy one over the other. We've got a pyramid here, so let's start from the bottom, the least expensive, and work our way up. First up on the pyramid, the Pentium G4400. If you're willing to consider base clock overclocking, this makes the G4400 a Skylake version of the G3258, an overclockable dual-core processor. It isn't boasting hyper-threading nor a large amount of L3 cache, but it packs a heck of a punch with its two cores and for half the price of its hyper-threaded counterpart. If you ask me, it's worth considering for builds ranging anywhere from 300 to 500 US dollars. For more on the G4400 specifically, check out the corresponding video I have linked in this description. Next up is the FX6300, another budget-friendly option, no doubt. It's more powerful than the G4400 by all respects, but unless you can find one for around the price of a G4400, I recommend staying away for now, and here's why. It utilizes the outdated AM3 Plus socket, DDR3, and PCI Express 2.0. Don't get me wrong, it handles games no problem. My brother, and I'm sure many of you, still use the 6300, but at this point in time, with Zen just around the corner, mind you, and competitive options from the blue team just, just straight flooding the market, I can't recommend any CPU from AMD at this time. The same goes for the FX8300. While undoubtedly more powerful than the similarly priced i3-6100, I proved that right here, it still compromises the upgrade factor that the Skylake platform practically owns at this point. If you're on a very tight budget, however, finding these on sites like eBay for well under 100 US dollars could be viable. In my opinion, you shouldn't pay any more than about 60 US dollars for the FX6300 and, I don't know, maybe 70 to 80 bucks for an FX8300. Now on to the odd child, the i3. I've owned both the i3-4150 from Haswell and the i3-6100 from Skylake. The 4150 was in the first PC I ever built, by the way. But upon comparing them to their i5 counterparts, again, videos linked in this description, I found that the i3s fell vastly short of the quad cores. And it's because of that. i5s have four physical cores, allowing for four lanes of simultaneous prepping and processing. But hyperthreading doesn't make up for what is lost in the i3s. I explain why in a video right here. All in all, I will say this. If you can afford in any way, shape, or form to shell out the extra 60 to 80 bucks for an i5 over an i3, do it. Even a severely underclocked i5, like the 6400, sitting around here somewhere, uh, will perform much better than even a base clock overclocked i3-6100. Four physical cores really do make all the difference. I know that money's tight and that prices can vary from country to country, but I'd be willing to compromise on other aspects of my build, the case and power supply for starters, to make room for an i5. For gaming, in my opinion, either go G4400 on an ultra-budget option or i5. You'll get more bang for your buck. The i3 is the awkward middleman. It's strategically priced by Intel, they do that for a reason, so it's about twice as expensive as the G4400, but nowhere near twice as powerful as the two-core, two-thread counterpart. And now on to the i5s. I've owned the 4690K, the 6400, the 6500, and 6600K SKUs. All of them offer unique competitive advantages. The 4690K utilizes older architecture and an older platform. I know I harped on the FX series for that, but hear me out here. If you can find it for a good deal less than its Skylake counterpart, I say go for it. Here's why. You won't notice any substantial difference between the two. I have a video verifying that in this description. The same can be said of the 4460 here, although you'll have no possibility of base clock overclocking. Even a locked i5 will perform better than an overclocked i3, and i3s aren't naturally overclockable. I said the base clock method is really the only way to get around that, and that's only on the Skylake platform, but if you're choosing between a 4460 for uh, somewhere around 150, 160 US dollars, and a $120 i3-4150, go for the 4460, eat that $40 cost, you'll definitely reap the extra benefits. For the sake of utilizing DDR4, Skylake chipsets, and newer, more efficient architecture, however, opting for either the 6400, 6500, 6600, or 6600K may be in your best interest. I've owned every Skylake i5 except for the non-K 6600, 
for the simple reason that, from my point of view, the added cost doesn't really justify the marginal frequency increase. That, and base clock overclocking is viable for all three if you're willing to throw down a bit more for a Z170 chipset or any of ASRock's sky overclocking motherboards. More on that here. In my personal opinion, the best bang for the buck CPU you can buy for gaming today is the i5-6500. Coming in at around 180 to 190 US dollars currently, although you can find it on sale for much less if you're looking pretty much every day, it'll bring a high enough frequency with turbo boost and a sufficient amount of cores and cache to the table. Even better, you aren't necessarily obligated to pair it with an expensive Z170 motherboard or a premium RAM kit. Now the 6600K is intended for an entirely different user. It has an unlock multiplier, meaning that you really don't have to do much in terms of tweaking things in your BIOS to get this thing up to around 4.4 to 4.6 gigahertz with a decent cooler. But as I've proven in a video I have linked in this description, I have tons of videos linked there, just bear with me, CPU overclocking really doesn't change much when it comes to just gaming, so why would a gamer purchase this? Well, for one, they're actually great multitaskers. While not as efficient as its 6700K counterpart, it can be easily overclocked to upwards of 4.6 GHz with a solid air or water cooler. This will aid in content creation tasks, stall time reductions, and even multitasking operations in principle. You'll also be somewhat forced to purchase a Z170 motherboard, more expensive yes, but offering many more features as well, SLI and Crossfire, 5.1 surround sound, adequate cooling solutions, not to mention they look better as well. I don't recommend a 6600K for 95% of gamers, you simply won't see a great enough increase in performance to justify the price hike, but if you're consistently switching between both video games and content creation software, the 6600K can be that viable compromise you've been looking for. In your case, $100 will go a much further way for a better GPU than it will for a better CPU. That is to say, choosing this over this makes much more sense for the avid gamer and even occasional content creator. Take it from someone like myself, I pretty much edited and rendered on all of these processors in the studio, and I can tell you without a doubt that these two are fairly close when it comes to cost to performance, that ratio there for editing and rendering. The frame rate differences are minimal, and the edit render time differences aren't great enough in my opinion for the $100 delta to make sense for anyone who just occasionally edits and renders videos. Now, in the midst of the whole i5 vs i7 discussion, again I have several videos already covering those head-to-head -head mashups, in comes the sneaky old Xeon. I'll be completely honest with you here, I've only owned one and I'll tell you why. Motherboard options. I had to hunt for one I liked and ended up switching halfway through the process. C232 and C236 motherboards are the only ones currently supporting Skylake Xeons, not to be confused with Broadwall E Xeons, which is disappointing seeing as though Haswell Xeons were 100% compatible with consumer grade motherboards, not the case here. To limit this selection even further, if you intend to base clock overclock a Xeon like this one, you'll need to purchase one of ASRock's special Sky overclocking motherboards for the C232 chipset. These Xeons also don't offer integrated graphics, meaning that you'll get no picture on your monitor unless you're sporting a dedicated graphics card. In most cases, it won't really apply to you, but if you plan on waiting two or three weeks for your graphics card to arrive after the fact, keep in mind that you won't be able to use your computer until that card arrives. So then, Greg, with all of these drawbacks, why the heck would I want to purchase one of these? The answer is price. Let's consider this one, the Xeon E3 1230v5. It features 14 nanometer Skylake architecture, 4 cores, 8 threads, 8 megabytes of L3 cache, turbo boost technology, and low thermal design power all identical to the i7-6700. Stock frequencies vary slightly, but these can be negated with simple base clock overclocks. And that brings us to the i7-6700K, perhaps my favorite processor, not because of the price necessarily, but because of how versatile this thing actually is. It's only a little over 300 US dollars, but it can pretty much do anything you want it to do, apart from, you know, serious, serious workloads. If you aren't willing to compromise on an unlocked multiplier, I understand base clock overclocking isn't for everyone, then look no further than the 6700K. I mean that. Firmly, look no higher up the chain than the 6700K. I know, I know CPUs like the 6800K look tempting, right? Oh, six cores. Well, it's a six core consumer grade processor. Granted, on an enthusiast grade platform, it is a bit more expensive, but seems worth it, right? I'm getting two extra cores and four extra threads. Yeah, I could definitely reap those benefits, right? 
Look, here, here's my point. The 6700K will crunch even 4K footage with relative ease, take my word for it, I do it on a daily basis. It handles any game you throw at it, and overclocks like a beast. I've gotten mine up to 4.8GHz with, albeit, slightly sketchy temperatures. I've only gone up to the 6700K for the simple reason that it offers the best of both worlds. Like, it's been proven time and time again that the 6700K, thanks to its very strong single-core performance, outperforms even the 6800K, 5930K, and even 6950 50X, a nearly $2,000 processor in many cases. And until games begin heavily relying on more than four physical cores, don't worry, we've got a ways to go, the 6700K's price, roughly $330 US dollars, will be the most I ever spend on a CPU with which I intend to play video games. When it comes to rendering, sure, the more cores with a decent frequency you throw at it, the better off you'll be in the long run, and the experience will just be more enjoyable. But I only recommend these processors in very, very extreme cases, hence X99, the X standing for extreme. You get my point. If you want the best computing experience possible, to be completely honest, even the 6950X will fall short of multi-core, multi-CPU Xeon platforms worth tens of thousands of dollars. You'll never get the best, folks. It's, it's how technology works. Now, if you don't play video games and are only interested in content creation, you could make a case for the 6800K and maybe something like the 6900K, but that's as far as I'd ever be willing to go, and I've stayed away from X99 for that very reason. The costs, in my experience, outweigh the benefits of reduced rendering times and smoother editing among other things. And that's that. I know we've gone above my personal CPU pyramid at this point, but I wanted to make sure that I touched on enthusiast grade chips and explain why I've shied away from them up to this point. For what I do and what I imagine close to 99% of you do as well, any CPU up to the 6700K will suffice and certainly yield a greater performance per dollar ratio. So that's my take. You don't have to agree with everything I've just said. I understand that there are some power users, very specific power users that I didn't mention in this video, but I've owned every single one of these processes processors. Every single one you're looking at right now in this pyramid, I have owned and I've tested extensively, so I have a pretty good idea of what processor works well for what user. If you have any questions, concerns, or issues, leave them in the comment section below and myself or someone else can address them. If you liked or at least appreciated the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Let me know you think it did a good job. Think it did a bad job or for some reason hate everything about life. I understand some people like that. Give it a thumbs down. If you feel the first way though, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more content like this. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.